Hey everyone, as we know, all political careers end in failure, but with the resignation of Boris Johnson, a lot of speculation has been made as to what he's going to be doing with all that spare time on his hands. Perhaps go on one of those reality TV shows. I imagine that Love Island would be right up his street, albeit they likely don't pay him enough. He famously leads a very expensive lifestyle, and if you ever hear someone claim he's outstanding, it's very possibly a bank manager discussing his overdraft. As such, I thought we'd do a review of what the previous ten Prime Ministers got up to when they left office. Number one, Theresa May. She stayed on in the back benches as MP for Maidenhead, even staying on and keeping her seat at the 2019 election, so she clearly has no plans, very much like her strategy when it came to Brexit. There's really not much to say she hasn't published a book, although she did get some cash for speaking in America before the pandemic prevented her from leaving the country. Curiously, there's been talk about her becoming Secretary General of NATO, and she was recently therefore banned from ever visiting Russia. Not that I can really think of any reason she'd want to go there right now, unless you're an assassin or something. Number two, David Cameron. He famously bought a shed for £25,000 when he left office in which to write a memoir, which got fairly decent reviews, although he was paid 800 grand for it, so you'd expect it to be okay. However, his main hobby really got going when he became an advisor to Greensill Capital, who was paid $1 million a year for 25 days' work, in addition to $60 million in share options. He was certainly earning his keep, though he convinced Matt Hancock to get the NHS to use Greensill's earned app. And when the pandemic broke out, he convinced the taxpayer-owned British Business Bank to give him an unsecured loan of £400 million. The whole grubby situation was sleazy enough that they've since changed the rules. So along with how he called UKIP's bluff by calling on the Brexit referendum, it's nice to know that he's still largely affecting change by messing things up. Although I'm sure his mother and his bank manager are very proud of him. Number three, Gordon Brown. He stayed on as a backbencher for a couple of years, although he mostly spent that time becoming involved in the Scottish independence referendum. Of course, his main ambition was to get the top job at the IMF, although David Cameron blocked the idea correctly, seeing that it would be like putting Dracula in charge of a blood bank. Brown is famous for two things. Number one, being one of the few PMs to never win an election. Number two, spending a decade promising an end to boom and bust, without realising that he was personally manufacturing the largest boom and bust in the UK's entire history. And the UK is a pretty old country. He spent the last decade or so doing some laudable work with charity although he himself is paid via a charity foundation so that it means that he doesn't have to pay any tax that would actually go and help alleviate the problems in the first place. Number four, Tony Blair. He left office and set up shop in the Middle East, possibly under the misunderstanding that the West Bank was a financial institution. He's earned roughly £100 million since leaving office, although it's always put a smile on my face when I think about how his entire career has worked to rebuild the Labour Party and be president of a federal Europe was all destroyed in about three years thanks to Jeremy Corbyn and Nigel Farage. I remember seeing him be interviewed at Davos where he you know, guaranteed a second referendum and it must annoy him that out of a decade's work which included things like fixing Northern Ireland, he's largely seen as a warmonger. He claims to have gone through a religious rebirth since, although it's typically a wishy-washy form of Catholicism that also includes New Age symbols, magic pendants, and a belief that the Bible is something you can pick and choose bits from, a bit like when he got rid of Clause 4. And of course, I'm not really sure where the church stands on that whole thing where he had an affair with Rupert Murdoch's ex-wife. Number five, John Major. He spent the day after the 97 election at the Oval, where Surrey won by six wickets, which was one of the few victories Major had experienced for years, seeing as how his last years in power were very much like watching the collapse of an English test match side. He went on to be head of Surrey and later the MCC, and he wrote a number of very well-received books about the history of cricket, as well as the usual flotilla of directorships and charity appointments. His main charity appearances, though, seem to be on the BBC, where he turns up from time to time to moan about Brexit or act as if he's owed respect simply for being less unpopular than Neil Kinnock was back in 92. Curiously, he was also appointed a special guardian to Princes William and Harry after their mother died, which is partly why you see him at a number of royal appearances these days. Albeit the most curious of stories was more when it was revealed that he and Edwina Curry had been having an affair for years. How did they keep that a secret, you ask? Well, like one of his cricketing heroes, I'm stumped. Number six, Margaret Thatcher. In government, she was polarising. Depending where you were and where you were living at the time, most people agree on that. But after she left government, not a lot of positive things you can really say about her. And that comes as someone who personally watched her funeral procession at St Paul's. She took up a job with Philip Morris, who paid her half a million pounds a year to promote smoking. And then she also campaigned for the release of Augusta Pinochet and encouraged both George Bush and Tony Blair to invade Iraq. She's quite a cheerleader for Tony Blair, really. He was one of the few people invited to her 80th birthday party. Someone else in attendance was her old friend and later foe, Geoffrey Howe who summed up how her true post-ministerial legacy was just the sheer extent of how her legacy had changed the face of Britain forever. Quote, Her real triumph was to have transformed not just one party, but two, so that when Labour did eventually return, the great bulk of Thatcherism was accepted as irreversible. End quote. Number seven, James Callaghan. He resigned at the end of the 1970s in the winter of discontent, although he did stay on until after the 1980 party conference where he changed the voting system so that Michael Foote could be elected. That same voting system would years later lead to Ed Miliband being elected Labour leader rather than his more competent brother. Callaghan was also one of the last vaguely honourable retirements, not a huge amount of private sector work, although he was a non-exec director at the Bank of Wales. Although one standout achievement was changing the rules so that the Great Ormond Street Hospital would forever retain the rights to Peter Pan. 
There's also an anecdote kicking around that in 1997 a volunteer phone staffer was phoning up random Labour Party members looking for recruits to go walking about the streets and James Callaghan was asked if he thought about becoming more involved in politics to which he responded to the youngster that he thought that being Prime Minister decades before had been enough. Number 8, Howard Wilson. He resigned after a diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease, although he claimed to be exhausted and simply retiring because he was 60 like any other working man. On his way out, though, he handed out a few questionable honours, including a lordship to Joseph Kagan, who'd manufactured his favourite jacket. And then he had a brief stint on television, hosting two episodes of Friday Night, Saturday Morning. It's quite terrible TV if you ever look it up. It's often listed in those top tens list of worst TV shows ever, alongside that sitcom about Hitler, that naked game show that Keith Chegman hosted, and any episode of Question Time filmed since the Brexit referendum. Number nine, Ed Heath. He spent years in the back benches after he stood down complaining about the rise of Thatcher, both as party leader and then later as prime minister, with many referring to him as the incredible sulk. Supposedly a meeting between the two of them was so short that Thatcher ended up staying a half hour for coffee with his private secretary so that the press wouldn't cotton on to how short and badly it had gone. The 1980s saw him watch as the policies of monetarism and privatisation went against everything he'd stood for, and he continued to turn down offers of a cabinet position or an overseas role with either the UN or even becoming ambassador to America, simply because Margaret Thatcher had offered it up as an idea. There's a lot of speculation about his private life, but I guess the less said about that the better, although I guess maybe some of us will live long enough to see the private papers eventually be released. And number 10, we'll finish this list with Sir Alec Douglas Home, the last PM born during the Edwardian era, and the last to have been in the Lords before he took up the role as Prime Minister. He got the job when Macmillan was forced to resign due to the Perfumo affair, which really goes to show you how trivial the Boris Johnson scandals really were. I mean, Howard Macmillan's Defence Secretary had been sharing a Lady of the Night with a Soviet naval attaché, versus what, drinking some wine that a staffer bought you from Tesco? Anyway, there wasn't really much to Home's Premiership, it was one of the shortest ever, and after a year he went back to working at the House of Lords, which is where it started from. He came from money, so I guess Yes, that explains things a bit. He spent most of his retirement fishing, hunting, writing a couple of books and keeping to himself. All very different to today. But then as they say, the past is a foreign country. Although if it is, it does make you wonder why the Daily Mail keep talking about it in such a positive way. Anyway, if you like these, click subscribe.